current state of the UFC and UFC champions is pretty bad. It's not looking too good. We have, you know, one of our worst sets of UFC champions ever. You have to go pretty much all the way back into like the 1990s, the 2000s to find a worst set of champions. So I decided that today what we're going to do is go through champions that I miss because there's so many UFC champions in every single division that I kind of find myself looking back at, whether it's a compilation on Twitter or whether I'm on ESPN, just looking through all the champions. And I'll be like, bro, I miss him as a champion. Damn, I wish he was the current champion right now. He was so fun. He was good on the mic. He was good inside the cage. He was everything. And now I kind of look at our current champions and I'm like, what happened? What happened to the UFC? So that's what we're going through today. But before we get into it, make sure to like, subscribe, that YouTube shit. It truly, truly does help me out a ton. Your one like, yes, one like, which right to a hundred more people with the click of a button. And also make sure to subscribe because there's only like 25% of the people that watch my videos that are subscribed. Let's get right into it though. Starting off, we're going to start off with the 125 pound division. There is an obvious, obvious, obvious selection here. And the obvious selection is Demetrius Johnson, DJ. I'm not picking him. And I know some of you are going to say, I'm going to get a ton of comments like, what about DJ? What about DJ? What about DJ? Why didn't you pick TJ? I don't really like champions for the most part that are super dominant. Don't get me wrong. We can all appreciate how skillful DJ is. He's one of the greatest mixed martial artists of all time. But I still think even now, it's not that fun to watch a guy get 11 defenses. It's not that fun to just watch a guy that is levels above the competition. I can appreciate him. I can appreciate how good DJ is. And I wish that 125 was just a little bit more stacked when he was fighting. But he's not the guy that I miss. The guy that I truly do miss is Davison Figueredo. When he had that run where him and Moreno were going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, and they were always banger fights. They were always really, really good fights. I don't know how the 125 pound division wasn't more popular. I don't know how people didn't appreciate the 125 pound division more because it was pretty much a fight where you can guarantee this fight's not only going to be really close, it's 50-50 when you're going into it. It's going to be a really, really good fight. Like, neither of them were super heavy wrestling, but there was a bit of wrestling between, like, we've had some of those fun scrambles ever inside those fights, and they both love to strike. They both love to strike. They both love to entertain. So this was, without doubt, one of my favorite runs ever at 125, because before that, you had Cejudo, which was like, yeah, he's pretty fun. He's pretty nice. And after that, we've had Pantoja, and I like Pantoja. He puts on really, really fun fights too, but it doesn't quite give me that same feel as going into a Figueredo and Moreno fight. It doesn't quite give me that same feeling as Davison Figueredo when he had two fights inside 30 days, two defenses inside 30 days. Like some of the wildest shit ever, he's still, even with Alex Pereira kind of lurking around all of these records for most fights in a certain amount of time, he's still the only ever UFC fighter to headline back-to-back -back pay per views. Like, that is crazy. That's absolutely crazy that you are the guy for back-to-back -back pay per views. Think about how much damage you take in fights. The fact that 30 days later, as a champion, not even as like a Hamza Chamaya, first fight, second fight inside the UFC, but as a champion that you're turning back 30 days later saying, yeah, fuck it. Doing that weight cut again is absolutely crazy. So that's why Miss Davidson Figueredo, he's the guy at 125, him and Moreno. They're kind of a package deal, like I always say. But him and Moreno, their rivalry, everything that Figgy did at 125, I miss him so much. After that, we have 135. This one, for most of the people that have been around the channel, this one, for most people that know who my favorite UFC fighter ever, should be a pretty obvious one. I was kind of tempted to put down Sean O'Malley here, but when you look at his title run, the Aljo fight was good, it was fun. The Cheeto fight and then the Merab fight. Like the Cheeto fight was just him slapping the dog shit out of somebody, and Merab fight was like, yeah, that's pretty awful. But the guy that I have to put down here is the guy that got me into the UFC. The reason why I'm a fan of the UFC today, it's Cody Garbrandt. Cody Garbrandt had a short lived title run. Yes, we all know that. We all know that he didn't have, you know, a GSP run, a DJ run, even a Figueredo run where he got a few defenses. But my God, if I could put somebody in their prime back into 135 right now, Cody Garbrandt would be so much fun. And I know that they've talked a whole lot of shit, him and Sean O'Malley, but could you imagine that matchup? Could you imagine a prime Cody Garbrandt before he got ruined by TJ Dillashaw, who apparently nobody knows, by the way. I know we've all seen those videos of him going into McDonald's and not a single person knows him. One person even has the view is Canelo. But Cody Garbrandt against Sean O'Malley would be so much fun. That would be so much fun. You get Cody Garbrandt's speed, his footwork, his quickness against Sean O'Malley's KO power, everything. That would be one of my favorite mythical matchups at 135 ever. And Cody Garbrandt, the Cody Garbrandt that fought Dominic Cruz, I think he beat Sean O'Malley. I truly, truly do think he beat Sean O'Malley. I think he was too good. He was too fast. He was too quick. And Cody Garbrandt is still, I don't want to call that performance underrated because pretty much everybody knows about it. 
But we all need to think in our heads, this was a guy coming in on his debut title performance, coming into a fight against a guy that had beaten every single person in his gym, had lost to him. And he comes in and he 50-45s him in one of the most beautiful performances you're ever going to see inside the UFC. So Cody Garbrandt, the things I do to have him back at 135, oh my God, bro. I miss him so bad. I miss him so, so bad. Also on some new fight news for Cody Garbrandt right now, but him and his prime, different gravy. After that, we have 145 and 145 is the notorious Conor McGregor. There's a ton of guys that I could have put down here, like for 135. You have obviously Volkanovski's run, who I was super close to putting down Volkanovski. You have Max Holloway. Like, there's no bad champions at 45. And to be honest, I wouldn't replace Ilya Taboria right now as a champion. I like him as a champion. I think that, you know, as long as he continues to take fights against those guys at 145 and is going, hey, Conor, hey, Islam Makachev, hey, Sean O'Malley, somebody come and find me from a different division. I think that he's going to be perfect as a champion. But Conor McGregor, if you guys don't remember the hype, and I kind of reminisce on it a little bit, I have that nostalgia for it because Conor McGregor was the first person to make me watch the UFC. Cody Garbrandt made me fall in love with the UFC, but obviously Conor McGregor, being Irish, was the first guy to make me watch the UFC. And the hype going into every single fight at 145 was unbelievable. Like the hype that this guy had when he was fighting Dennis Seaver was crazy. Then he goes Max Holloway, Dustin Poirier, and it goes levels up and up and up and up and up. And every fight was a dominant performance. Every fight was round one, round two KO, calling the KO, calling what shot he's going to hit him with, doing it all inside UFC against the highest level guys. And bear in mind, Conor McGregor at this time was like a BMF type guy. He was a guy where Jose Aldo pulled out. Conor McGregor said, no problem. Text me at the end of the day who I'm fighting. Doesn't even care who he's fighting. Goes up against a completely different matchup and Chad Mendes, who's a wrestler. Like, that's real BMF shit. And then he gets into that, obviously, the title fight against Jose Aldo, where he's another debutante title fight. All of the pressure on his shoulders. You rarely, rarely, rarely ever go into a title fight as a challenger with more pressure than the champion, especially if the champion is potentially the greatest 145er of all time. And Conor McGregor had more pressure. Conor McGregor was going into that with the pressure of the entire world. And he still performed. And he did it inside one round. And he did it inside 13 seconds. So his run at 145, the hype, the fact that he was able to transcend the UFC and turn into this global superstar, the things that I would do for that run again are fucking incredible. Just going back, thinking about it, staying up to watch the Jose Aldo fight. It was different. It was an absolutely fucking different time for the UFC. After that, we have 155. And 155 has a lot of great champions. One of my favorite ones is the champion right now. Islam Makachev, I talk about him constantly. I talk about how fun of a fighter he is, how great he is in every single realm. But I do miss the man that was there before him. I do miss Charles Oliveira. Charles Oliveira, when he had that Hall of Fame run from 2021 on, was so much fun. He beat Dustin Poirier. He beat Justin Gaethje. And he was doing it all in dominant fashion. Beat Michael Chandler. And there was never, ever, ever a boring Charles Oliveira fight. Charles Oliveira would get knocked down in the first and he'd come back in the second. Then he'd knock you out in the third. He was going against the best strikers, beating the best strikers. He was going against the best wrestlers, beating the best wrestlers. And I think he was one of the guys that changed the tide around how people view wrestling and jiu-jitsu inside the UFC. Because kind of around that Khabib timeline, everybody was looking at wrestling wrestling like all wrestlers are boring all these jiu-jitsu guys are boring like nobody even likes these guys why would i watch the ufc if a wrestler's fighting charles Oliveira changed that dynamic charles Oliveira showed people jiu-jitsu can be fun wrestling can be fun look at this guy coming into my garden you're like on the edge of your seat like how's he gonna get him this time how's he gonna get him this time he was pure box office entertainment he's one of the most entertaining champions ever and he was almost the prerequisite to what Alex Pereira is right now, where we saw once again, with the age of Conor McGregor, everybody thought you need to talk shit to be a superstar. You need to talk shit to be a superstar. You need to talk shit to be a superstar. And we had a lot of cases of guys in the UFC kind of forcing it. You know what I mean? We had characters created like Colby Covington, where a lot of guys forced that trash talk when it wasn't really them. And Charles Oliveira was the first of a few guys that came around after that Conor McGregor era that showed you, listen, you don't need to talk shit. If you're that fun inside the cage, if you're just constant finish inside the cage, every fight's going to be entertaining. You can let your work inside the cage do the talking for you. 
And that's what Charles Oliveira did. He's one of my favorite 155 pound champions ever. I would have loved to have seen prime Charles against Khabib or Islam. We never really got to see it. I'm not sure if that was prime Charles when he fought Islam. But if it was, it just shows you how good Islam is. But I'd still love to get prime Charles back at 55. After that, we have 170. And 170 is going to be a little bit of a weird one. It might not be a name that you know just as well. It might not be a name that you even remember that well as being a 170 pound champion. It's Robbie Lawler. 170 hasn't had the luxury of having the most entertaining champions on the planet. You had Tyron Woodley, who's one of the most hated guys inside the UFC. You have GSP, who at his time was pretty loved, but I wouldn't put him down there as one of my favorite champions, especially because I barely watched any of his title run. Then you have Usman, eh, like he's fine as a champion. Leon Edwards, I like him a lot, but I wouldn't put him down there as my most entertaining. But Robbie Lawler, Robbie Lawler was violence incarnate. Like, he was unbelievably violent inside the cage. Obviously, we all know him against, which I'm sure you have. If you haven't watched that fight in its entirety, please go and watch it. It's fucking incredible. It's a masterpiece of a fight. There's a reason why it's still talked about to this day. There's a reason it's the greatest UFC fight of all time. And that wasn't a one-solve for Robbie Lawler. That wasn't just like, oh, he had this one great fight and then he moved on from there. Every single fight wasn't that good, but they were all wars. There's a reason why he's a cult hero. There's a reason why people are still, you know, rooting from to his very, very last fight. And he had this kind of crazy UFC career, this crazy UFC story where he gets that UFC title, goes on a bit of a loss streak, comes back in his final fight and gets a round one KO. Like you couldn't script it as well. If that was in a movie, I'd kind of look at it and be like, uh, the ending was kind of cheesy with him getting that round one KO when nobody thought he was going to win that fight. But Robbie Lawler really did it. And for a division that's kind of barren of really, really fun champions, for a division that's kind of barren of really, really entertaining champions, Robbie Lawler was the anomaly. He was the guy that was pure violence. He only wanted violence inside the cage, whether he was getting hit or you were getting hit. He was making sure that that canvas was bloody by the end of the fight. And I miss champions like that inside the UFC. I miss guys with a little bit of disregard for them. I miss guys that had that little bit of crazy and didn't have all the technique in the world. Although Robbie Lawler's technique was still really, really good. Wasn't like this precise guy or super, super clean in terms of his technique. But he was going to bully you. And he was going to make sure that you fucking hated every minute that you were fighting him. After that, we have 185. And 185 for me, I was tempted to put down a guy like Anderson Silva here. But when Anderson Silva became a champion, I was two years old. And when he lost his belt, I was nine years old. So I wasn't really around all that much for Anderson Silva. I can't encapsulate what the vibes of the UFC fan base were, how people really, really thought of him. You can go back and watch their fights as much as you want, which I have. But you're not really going to get a full grasp on what it was like when he was a champion. So what I've got down here instead is the Israel Adesanya against Alex Pereira rivalry. This was one of the most fun rivalries in UFC history. And I feel like people are going to look back at this because right now it's not viewed as like a top three rivalry ever, but I truly do think it's that. I think it's a top three rivalry in UFC history. It's hard to beat John Jones against DC. That had something different, something really special to it. But this is pretty close. This is pretty, pretty close. The backstory to this rivalry is insane. Like when you go through the whole kickboxing thing, when you go through Alex Pereira hunting him down and then catching him in the UFC and then the hunter becomes the hunted. Like there's so much going on with this that you could make legit. There have been made one hour 40, one hour 50, like film length documentaries just about this rivalry. It has so much going on with it. And it didn't really need shit talk. We know that Alex Pereira doesn't do shit talk. We know that he kind of has that stoic presence and that he doesn't use his mouth to sell fights. He uses his fists. It's provided some of the most iconic moments in UFC history for us. If you think about both of their fights inside the UFC, you have the first fight where it's like this crazy upset where Alex Pereira gets it done in the fifth round when pretty much everybody was like, oh yeah, no, he's done. Israel Adesanya is just way better than him. He's grown a whole bunch since their fight inside kickboxing. And then Alex Pereira catches him and he finishes him. That was a crazy upset. Then we have the second fight where Izzy looks like he's on the downfall. Izzy looks like he's about to lose. And then he pulls a KO out of absolutely nowhere. This rivalry had everything. This fight had absolutely everything. And it was kind of refreshing to see a rivalry that was just through the fight. Like you could feel the tension. You could feel the anxiety in the room when these guys were facing off. You could see like both of their, you know, muscles twitching. They were just so ready to get in there and fight. And this was something that could appeal to the casuals, to people that love like the tactics, people that love mixed martial arts. It could appeal to absolutely everybody. After that, we have 205. 205, what I have down here is John Jones's first run. And I know for DJ at 125, I said that I don't really like guys that are too dominant. I don't really like guys that, you know, go on this 11 streak. But John Jones, when he was first getting in there at 205, when he was first getting his feet wet, it was so much fun just seeing this guy that's like 
a different thing to anything we've seen in MMA before. This 23-year-old that's coming in and submitting all of the best guys over and over and over and over again, or finishing all the best guys over and over and over again. When you see what he did to Leo to Mashida, when he literally walks away with a dead body left behind him, one of the most iconic photos in UFC history. When you see what he did to Rampage Jackson, when you see his ability to win, like he got out of one of the deepest arm bars I've ever seen. And he was like a freak of nature. A freak of nature, not only physically, but mentally. He was kind of putting on this character for most of his first one where he was trying to pretend that he was a good guy and a nice guy. But you could feel it, that he was a pure warrior. You could feel that he was like just destined for violence. He was destined to become a UFC fighter. And his first run showed us the levels to mixed martial arts because he just refused to lose. In that Gustafson fight, the first one, he refused to lose that fight. In that Leona Mashida fight, he refused to lose that fight against Rampage Jackson crawling into the cage because the only thing you haven't seen in your nightmares. Like, he is a terrible, terrible guy outside of the cage. Don't get me wrong. But inside the cage, inside the cage, this first run, oh, this like chills down your spine type of stuff. This was absolutely unbelievable to watch. And then finally, we have heavyweight, we have 265. And... To be honest, the champions we've had at 265 in the last few years haven't been that great. It hasn't been that fun to watch these guys. I was kind of tempted to put down Francis, but he knocked out Stipe Miocic and then had a pretty boring fight against Cyril Gann. And it's like, no, don't really want to put him down here. I can't put down John Jones down here. There's a few guys you kind of look at and you're like, there's nobody here that I really actually want to put down for 265. But the guy that I put down is Stipe Miocic. And more Stipe Miocic's first run inside the UFC. Because I think that that was actually super entertaining. It was super, super entertaining. He finished Fabricio Verdum, round one KO. He finished Alistair Overeem, round one KO. He finished Junior Dos Santos, round one KO. Like three round one KOs as your first three title defenses or as your title win and then your next two defenses is pretty insane. That's pretty special. Like there's maybe one guy inside the entire UFC that can say that he got round one KO after round one KO after round one KO as a champion. Like getting to the highest level and then finishing the best guys on the planet with inside one round consistently. And then not only that, but he beat Francis Ngannou in his next defense as well. And that Francis Ngannou defense isn't talked about enough because he truly showed Francis Ngannou the levels to the game. You know, when we see a new prodigy come up, we see this new fighter and he's like unbelievable. He's smoking everybody. And then he gets to that championship level and he gets showed. You might be able to beat these guys that are top five. You might be able to beat these guys that are top 10, top 15 easily with inside a round with, you know, that big mighty left hook that we saw with what he did to Alistair over him where he literally nearly decapitated the man. But you can't do it against the best of the best. And I love that. I love when a champion shows someone that's coming up, shows someone he needs to get better. Shows a Francis and Ganu that. That left hand, that right hand might work against everybody else. But when you get to the 0.01%, it won't work against me. That is UFC champions that I miss and that I'd love to see back inside the UFC in their primes. Make sure to like, sub, the YouTube channel. I'll catch all you boys tomorrow. Peace.